Most of you probably know a long time ago we used to have a reactor down in the basement of this building and unfortunately we lost that in the mid 90s. Uh, currently within the UC system there are still two reactors, a small one at UC Irvine and a much larger one run by UC Davis. And um, here today to talk about is Dr. Wesley Frey. He's the facility director at the McClellan Research, uh, Research Center. Uh, Wesley got his undergraduate degree, his BS degree in nuclear engineering from this department in 2001. He went off to uh, Oregon State University where he got his PhD and came back to California and worked for a while at Stanford, that other university across the bay, um, doing medical physics, uh, health physics I should say. And he's currently the uh, facility director at McClellan Nuclear Research Center and he's here today to talk to us about the challenges and rewards of operating a university nuclear reactor. Wesley. Okay, well that's good to know if some things have changed and all the students are still sitting in the back. So this is uh, not a super technical talk. Uh, I'm here to talk about the facility. Uh, we're trying to move forward with the educational and outreach plan. We'd like to obviously involve uh, this department. Um, UC Davis does not have a nuclear engineering program. It has a reactor, and this department has a very good department. It doesn't have a nuclear reactor. So talk about the facility, some of the possibilities. Um, and also, probably literally 15 years ago to the day, I was in that chair back there, we'll pick. Uh, so I never thought that then, 15 years from now, I would be director at a facility like this um, at a relatively young age. Um, so I'm giving a, a little bit of advice of what, it's, what my journey has been like and things that you'll probably encounter uh, sooner than you think. Um, every place that I've gone, every national lab that I've gone, every university I've gone, the, the Berkeley name really does carry a lot of weight. Um, and uh, enough weight that they uh, made me director of that. So, okay, um, and one last thing before we start, I'm a big Cal football fan. Uh, if you thought, if you think they're not so great now, I went here four and a half years. And I was here statistically the five worst years in Cal football history. So, um, and last week I got to go to the UT Austin reactor, and for those of you who don't know, there's a little bit of bad blood between Cal football and UT Austin football. So my plan was I was going to wear a jacket with a cow shirt underneath and then take a selfie of me at the reactor before they escorted me off the facility. But I chickened out. I didn't do it. So, so uh, that's, uh, that's our reactor. We'll talk a little bit more about the core and all the stuff around it. Um, and then that's, of course, us operating. How many of you have seen a research reactor or been out to McClellan? Okay, so about half. Okay, perfect. So that's why I'm going to talk a little bit more about my experience and not quite so much uh, technical details of it. Um, so this is our building. Um, it looks a lot different from the outside than other trigger facilities, and it looks really different from other trigger facilities on the inside. Um, we used to have uh, September 10th, 2001, there's a big sign calling me for the research center, and then the next day it was taken down. Uh, so a little bit about the facility. Um, so it's, it's a very uh, unusual facility in that it was not built by the university. It was actually built by the United States Air Force. Uh, back in the 80s, it's, we go back and forth, but UT Austin saying that they're the newest, we say we're the newest, but uh, it was first, it depends on when you go uh, full power or first criticality on who's the youngest reactor, who's the best. So, um, so the, the Air Force originally built it for one specific thing, a neutron radiography, specifically on the F-111. It was a big swept wing fighter bomber and they were looking for uh, water corrosion inside the honeycomb structure. What was happening is um, this is the fighter bomber that would go supersonic at like a thousand feet elevation, drop the bombs before the sonic boom came in, uh, and then would be gone by the time the bombs were exploding uh, to make it very difficult to shoot down. And one of the things you don't want happening to a, a supersonic plane when it's at low elevation, lots and lots of drag, you don't want to have a little bit of water in the leading edge of the wing in the honeycomb structure. It'll flash the steam, rip off the panels, and the plane will crash. Um, so they, they, for the cost of losing one of these aircrafts, they built the entire facility. Um, it was a reasonably successful program. Um, in 2000, uh, the university took it over as part of the uh, closure of the, the base. Uh, we agreed to take it over. Uh, we are a, a two megawatt research reactor, um, and we're the highest rated trigger in the United States. So the next highest one is one, so we're twice that. But we almost only operate at, uh, at one. Uh, so everyone's reasonably familiar with triggers. It's the most common research reactor, very special fuel. Uh, and I tell everyone, including the person that I was talking to at the airport before, while I was flying back from Austin, about how safe it was and exactly what a negative temperature fuel coefficient meant. Um, 
So it's a very, very safe design uh, to the point where there's really only a few things you could do to purposefully damage the fuel. Uh, of course, I won't tell you what those things are. <laughs> uh, if you want to become a qualified reactor, you'll, you'll figure it out on your own how you would have to do that. Um, it's so, uh, the design is so fail-safe, basically we could withdraw all of our uh, control rods and reactor would spray them on its own. Um, if we have a LOCA, uh, we don't need any uh, water cooling, we don't need any forced air cooling. Actually, the air conditioning in the room would be enough, according to our analysis, uh, to cool off the core. So a meltdown is not physically possible. Uh, most people that I've run into, uh, the general public, don't believe me, but I assure you it's true. Okay, so moving in, yes? The uh, trigger reactor we set downstairs, but we were shutting it down uh, just just for uh, Jolly's, just before it was shut down, they uh, uh, gathered all of the <coughs> local ANS local section members up above the um, thing and had us all look down at the pool, and then they shot the uh, control rods out of the core <laughs> using compressed air. We do that. Uh, we occasionally pulse. Uh, when I was at Oregon State, four dollar pulse. Wow, we're limited to $1.70, so not, it's, it's spectacular, but not, it's about the smallest anyone pulses that does pulse. When I was at Oregon State, I used to always give them a bad time. You guys should pulse more, it's, it looks really cool, it makes for a great show and tell. Everybody, the kids love it, the parents love it, and uh, they go, no, it's really hard on the fuel, you'll understand someday. And now when people come to visit, they go, you should pulse reactor more, it's really cool, everyone loves it, and I go, no, I'm responsible for this thing, now. it's really hard on the fuel, so. Even if there's a scientific reason to do it, which occasionally there is, we'll pulse, but if there's not, you know, we're not gonna pulse. The reactor had already been decommissioned. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we don't have any backup fuel, which I'll talk about, so that's also our reluctance to, to pulse. Um, okay, getting into a little bit of my own personal experience, crisis management, hopefully giving some slightly uh, sagely advice. These are my personal first when I was at MNRC. All of these actually did happen. So my first day, I, was the, I started out as RSO before I was director. It was reported to the state and federal authorities that we were dumping our primary water into a vacant field next to the facility. And they wanted to talk to the senior most person at the facility because our director wasn't there that day and our reactor supervisor was at a funeral. That was me. I'd been there 90 minutes. <laughs> um, the first fuel element I ever touched as a training reactor operator uh, got stuck, and at first they thought I was joking, and I said, I assure you I'm not joking, and they said, okay, this is what we want you to do, and they're right next to me. We want you to pull up very firmly, but whatever you do, don't pull on it too hard, otherwise you'll break the weld, and then it'll vent fission products in, into the room, and it'll be the worst thing that's ever happened here. So, and I'll come back to these at the end of the lecture, how they were all resolved, and what I learned from these things. Uh, my first day as director, which was just uh, three months ago, I was told by the NRC in an email that morning that I had two non-licensed operators operating the reactor. This is a very, very bad thing. It's not like driving without your license, which you just get a slap on the wrist for. I it's think a, you should resign. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, uh, so then the last one, later the same day, I was told the university was planning on decommissioning the facility at the expiration of our uh, license, which is August 2018, which was news to me. That was not discussed during the <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about what's it like to, to run a reactor like this. Not just the technical part, but, uh, but some of the non-technical things. So you have to balance the needs and wants of different folks. And really, it's the regulators, university, and the facility. And you'd think everyone would want the exact same things, but everyone advocates for something different. Does anyone want to guess what the only thing really at the intersection of all of these things are? Because the NRC doesn't care if we make money or not. They care what ratio we make it not the absolute amount. What's the only thing that everyone can agree on? Safety. safety, correct. So safety, and everyone has a different approach for getting there and proving it and so on and so forth. Um, so this is a lot of what I, what I do is, is balancing uh, these, these different things. Uh, one of the things that I left out is the public, uh, which uh, I love talking to people in airports. I don't bring it up, but I do, but eventually sometimes it does come out. Really what the public wants is we live in a society, and you all have figured this out, we live in a society that loves technology but hates science. It's fearful and distrustful of science, but loves technology. Um, so they really want the technological developments uh, that come along with reactors and the nuclear methods, you know, uh, doing neutron radiography on turbine blades to make sure jet engines don't blow up during mid-flight. Uh, but they don't want little risk, they want uh, zero risk, which we all know is impossible. <laughs> there's, there's a risk here, I get hit by a meteor. So 
which I'm glad you're recording because if it did happen, then, you know, my, my uh, <laughs> widow could look at a very uh, interesting video. Of, uh, so, uh, regulators. Okay, so this one is enormous. Uh, regulators, uh, uh, they want compliance because this is how they legally demonstrate safety to the public, is through compliance. That's why it's really important. Uh, we're regulated by the NRC, that's, that's our license. Uh, Department of Defense, because we do get items in from the Department of Defense. Uh, DOE, they own the fuel. Department of Transportation, because we occasionally transport radioactive things, sometimes to, uh, to your laboratory classes. FAA, because sometimes they are transported by air. Uh, Cal OSHA, because we're a business uh, within California. EPA, because they like to put their tentacles in everything. Uh, FBI, for, for background checks. Um, ATF, because we have alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. And, uh, just kidding. Uh, we have uh, explosives in the building, and they are responsible for explosives. Occasionally, we have explosives in the building. I'll talk about that later. Uh, and then we have multiple Sacramento County agencies for we produce some non-radioactive waste, oily rags, things like that. Uh, so we're kind of in a constant state of getting audited. Um, you never think that as an undergrad or a graduate student, you'll be dealing with a lot of auditors, but, but you will, and it's really not quite that terrible. Uh, the university wants compliance with all uh, regulations. They want student participation, research grants, uh, but they really don't want much cost, risk, or long-term obligation. Um, and that can be very challenging with a thing like a, a nuclear reactor. Um, they, it's typically pretty costly. The risk is relatively low, other than protesters, perhaps. Uh, the long-term obligation is, is relatively long. It's a very lengthy process to decommission these facilities. Uh, what the facility wants, and what I want, obviously compliance with all the regulators, uh, you know, redundancy in people and equipment. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. We have a lot of single fault failures, not that would result in an accident, they would what we call an end of facility accident that we couldn't recover from, we couldn't go critical. I work with a lot of guys from the Navy, they also call it, depending on who's involved, an end of career accident. And, uh, <laughs> what happens. and that's, uh, uh, they told me about when, I think it was, it was, a, it was a, I don't know if it was the Enterprise, but it ran aground in San Francisco Bay, and they said that is a perfect example of an end of career accident. The person in charge of that ship, uh, that was, they retired the next day. Okay, so our license, we operate under license R130. You can look it up on the NRC website and see thousands of pages of documents related to our facility. Our license expires in August of 2018. Um, so our, uh, there's a new reg, is everyone familiar with the new regs, what they are? Uh, so they're guidance documents from the NRC, uh, but really if there's no other guidance of how to do something, you pretty much have to follow them. They tell you you don't have to, but, but you have to follow them. So our license, 20 years ago, we were the first to write it in the new format, New Reg 1537. It's a systematic approach, how you write everything out, the descriptions, the accident analysis, all of that stuff. So we were the first to do that, and we'll be the last to do that, because they're getting away from these 20-year license renewals, and they're going to continuous renewal, or a five-year um, enhanced, I want to say uh, enhanced, quote Donald Trump, I won't quote him. Uh, enhanced frisking, or what he was saying. So it would be an enhanced inspection every five years. Some people are a little nervous about it because it can become uh, continuously renewing your license depending on who your regulator is. Uh, if you have a good relationship with them, they're reasonable, it might be better. Um, if your regulator is new every year, uh, it'll be really challenging to keep your uh, um, safety analysis report updated every year instead of every 20 years. Uh, so the NRC is charged uh, to maintain reasonable assurance, and this is their favorite term, reasonable assurance of public safety with imposing the minimum regulatory burden on the licensee. What's the issue with this? So None who, of those words are defined. Yeah, so, and, and who determines what minimum regulation is, the regulatory burden? Yeah, or what reasonable assurance is. Yeah, it's the NRC. They can just say, well, this isn't reasonable assurance, and we don't feel this is excessive uh, um, excessive burden on you. So this is what we go back and forth with uh, quite a bit with them. Uh, the NRC is concerned with worker safety and public safety. The 10 CFR series it basically accomplishes this. Um, the health physics program protects the workers from radiation. This is 10 CFR 20. Uh, there's a few things about it what you can influence and how much. Um, so what protects the public specifically at our facility? Yes. What physical thing protects people from? So at a big commercial power plant, you have three things, right? 
So you have the fuel cladding, you have the uh, uh, pressure vessel, you have the containment building. We don't have a pressure vessel and we don't have a containment building, so it's just the fuel cladding. So everything, that, all, the, all the operating specs, everything at the reactor, at a research reactor, is built around not exceeding peak fuel temperature so that that cladding doesn't rupture. Everything we do uh, is surrounding that. So it makes things uh, fairly easy for the most part. Uh, I mentioned we follow uh, New Rig 1537. The uh, document is several hundred pages long, uh, contains system descriptions, uh, program descriptions, operational requirements, and accident analysis. Um, ultimately, the regulators need to know what's the worst thing that could happen at the facility and how you'll make sure this doesn't happen. They literally want to know if the red phone in the middle of the night rings, what's the worst thing it could possibly be at your facility. Um, we work off of something called, sometimes it's with commercial power, it's really more uh, design basis accident. Uh, we have something called a maximum hypothetical accident. It was established many, many years ago, and I guess I'll, if any of the students know what it is, I guess I'll buy them a beer after the lecture. Okay, it's a, it's a single fuel element in air. For running indefinitely maximum power, single fuel element. Uh, rupturing in air. So you've had a loca, one fuel element fails. Because the analysis shows that you can't have a full core melting down. So the, the NRC folks, everyone got together and this was agreed upon years and years and years ago. And what they want to know is that will a 10 CFR limit be exceeded? So effluence to the public, worker being trapped in the reactor room, um, if they make sure it were to happen. Yes? The, uh, the fact that it's in air, does that, does that mean you can't account for uh, dissolution of uh, fission products filtering through the water use, using the water as a filter? Correct. That's why they do it that way. Because uh, a lot of the iodine and even some of the xenon get trapped. Uh, yeah. Um, so you would think if the MHA is agreed on by all parties, falls well short of any 10 CFR limits, relicensing uh, would be easy. I assure you it's, it's not and that sort of a big thing. The, our next big challenge at the facility is to successfully navigate the licensing. Uh, we've had people get a lot of uh, responses of saying uh, we effluence argon-41 to the air. Um, everyone, all the research reactors do. I think we're about 10 curies a year, which sounds tremendous, but you run through Gaussian plume models and, and all of that stuff, and it ends up being uh, about 1 one hundredth of a bellerin to the public per person, worst case scenario. So we're uh, three orders of magnitude under the limit but the NRC sometimes is not sure that that's good enough. So it's, uh, it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, and that's, uh, that's sort of uh, where, the, where the community's at, where the licensee and the NRC is at, is going back and forth on a lot of these things. And there's a lot of inconsistencies, so it's uh, going to be quite a battle. Okay, uh, our technical specifications. I never heard this term until I came to work at a reactor. So this is chapter 14 of our SAR. Uh, and it gives the legal specific stipulations we have to follow to operate the reactor. Like, if you're operating a reactor, you have to be a licensed reactor operator, things like that. Uh, peak fuel limits, um, the, the, um, how many um, continuous air monitors, how many radiation area monitors you need to operate, all of that is given um, there. And anytime anything happens, the first after we make sure everyone's okay, not that we really have accidents, but any kind of occurrence, anything unusual, first question everyone asks, is it a tech spec violation? That's what everyone asks. Wait, so going back to your first point in one of your first slides, you mentioned that two of your reactor operators were unlicensed. How are you guys not aware of that? I'll get, I'll answer that, I promise. Okay. They were licensed. Okay. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a misunderstanding, but I'll, I'll explain. Okay, okay um, so for example, uh, GA analysis conducted a long time ago at the, the beginning of the Triga fleet. Uh, they came up with, a, their, their analysis showed that if you stay above 930 degrees C during steady state operations and 1100 C during pulsing, uh, you, you can't break the fuel. You won't exceed the, uh, the, the internal pressure, won't exceed the, uh, the strength of the fuel so you won't have a rupture. And there is some conservatism built into that. You don't assume any temperature drop across the fuel gap or anything like that. Um, so uh, we stay below 750 is in our license uh, to give a little bit of a safety margin. Uh, when we're operating at one megawatt, we're really only at about 330 degrees C, so we're really far away from the limit. To run at our maximum two megawatts uh, would only put us at like 550 degrees C. So we actually can't 
something terrible would have to happen. You'd have to go in and defeat your safety channels in order to get to 750C, and I don't even know if it's possible with the excess reactivity we have in the reactor. Uh, so the tech spec that would come out of this also is that you have to monitor the two, the two hottest fuel elements uh, when the reactor is critical. Uh, so we monitor our two physically hottest fuel elements and assume all the fuels at this temperature. Uh, and they also stipulate how many times you have to check these channels to, to make sure that they, they actually work properly or they're within their calibration range and so on and so forth. And a tech spec violation is a really big deal, um, like end of career accident potentially if it's, if it's bad enough. And if it's deliberate, uh, there can be personal fines and jail time. So moving into uh, a little bit uh, away from the, the legal stuff, how, how one of these facilities operates. So the trigger fuel cycle is also another really big topic, you can see or lack thereof. Uh, so that's a trigger fuel element. Um, it's five inches each of the actual uh, zirconium hydride uh, uranium mixture. Uh, we run 20% uh, enriched, or less than 20%, so 19.9 or five, depending on who you ask. Uh, we have 20 weight percent fuel and 30 weight percent fuel. Um, so we never had the 70% enriched flip fuel, so we never got a new core like Oregon State got while you and I were there. Uh, so they don't have the problem for a while. We have to worry about it a little bit earlier. So when I arrived there uh, at, at MNRC four years ago, they said, um, don't worry, no one's making trigger fuel now, but in four years, they'll start making it again, and you guys can get your two or three elements every year that you ask for on our Christmas list. Um, at the same time, they also said that because of uh, the moratorium on the state of Idaho because of numerous lawsuits, we can't, Idaho can't take the fuel back and it can only go to Idaho. Uh, it could go to Savannah River potentially if the president signed a letter and had like $3 million a year for, to rent the dry cast storage. Uh, so it kind of has to go to Idaho. They said, don't worry, four years, we'll start shipping fuel. Uh, the MNRC has actually never shipped a single spent fuel element uh, from the facilities. We have everything we've ever used. Um, so that was four years ago, and uh, does anyone want to take a guess at the projected timelines for new fuel and fuel disposal? Four years. <laughs> Correct. It's still four years. <laughs> so part of it is you have to plan for what's, what's the worst thing that could happen for the facility? We don't get new fuel and we can't dispose of old fuel. So that's sort of what I have to plan for in the back of my mind worst case scenario, at the same time moving forward with programs and projects that assume we will get new fuel. Uh, so we have $5.50 excess reactivity, cold and clean. Uh, I was in a, a meeting with a pretty high level accountant from UC Davis and, and they said, well, how come you can't get fuel if it, if it costs that little? What's the <laughs> issue? And I, I said, I didn't really want to explain it to you. Uh, so we use about 25 cents per year, uh, but it does, uh, xenon buildup can be 50, 60 cents if we run eight hours the previous day, and to get up from ambient temperatures to 330C, uh, we, we lose about two and a half dollars. So our real excess is somewhere between, uh, it's really about 250 at one megawatt. So if we have enough fuel for, for 10 years. Um, we could gain a little bit of reactivity doing fuel flips, um, but you do run the risk is if you can't get a fuel element out like the first one I touched, you could you do a fuel shuffle, spend a whole week doing really stressful work, or probably two weeks doing really stressful work, um, gain 40 cents on your shuffle, and then lose 60 cents because you had to pull a fuel rod out and replace it with a graphite reflector. So we are kind of like the, or the, the DOE when it comes to this. We're going, we're going to shuffle fuel this year. Uh, no, no, we'll do it next year. And every year I've been there, we're going to do it next year. Um, although I've just said we would do it in four years because now, now that I'm in charge, we'll keep it off as long as we can. So decommissioning has been, it's a very, very interesting thing. Um, so all the facilities have a finite life. We know this. Um, the, the, most of these uh, typically go to research reactors. It's about 60 years, same as the commercial reactors. At, at some point, finding parts, the people and everything uh, just becomes really difficult. And what we, we, we encounter is a lot of the fundamental research that was done these reactors in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and it, it's been done. Um, and most of the research and a lot of work gravitates to whoever's the, the highest flux reactor. So Missouri, MIT, ATR, and Hyper is where mostly everything is done. Uh, but we still do some cool stuff at, at our place. Uh, so the cost of decommissioning a university reactor is between about $2 million for the facility in UC Irvine. It would be about this much. It's just a small reactor not a lot of activation in the basement of the chemistry building, 
and they're not going to knock down the whole chemistry building when they decommission the reactor. Um, and a hundred million dollars. Uh, it can take greater than 10 years of active efforts, so not just leaving it in safe store and coming back after 10 years, 10 years of actively doing things. Surveys, paperwork, everything. It's a very, very long process. Um, so most of the cost is associated with low-level activated materials. Finding them, finding out how far they reach, how deep it goes into the concrete. Does the concrete stop being activated? But then the rebar behind it is because its cross-section is higher effectively than the concrete. Uh, it can be pretty complicated. This is the work that I did at that other university across the bay that I won't mention. Uh, it's pretty interesting stuff, but um, the, the cost can be absolutely tremendous. Um, so we narrowed it down to between about eight, depending on who you ask, and $80 million. Uh, the eight came from an outside contractor. Um, and anyone want to guess where the $80 million came from? The same contractor. No, no, it actually, they, we were saying, I would say more like 30 to $40 million was my ballpark estimate. And the university didn't really believe us uh, collectively, because we all kind of came up with that number of the facility, until the NRC told them $80 million. Mm -hmm. So then they kind of started to believe us a little bit more. Um, so why is the, the MNRC decommissioning costs so high uh, and the uncertainty so large? And that is because, so this, those of you seen it before, this is a normal Triga pedestal. Um, so the core is in the middle there, on you know just chest level, beam ports, uh, the water shielding and coolant, uh, bio shield around it, um, and this normal kind, uh, the they benchmark it costing about 15 to 20 million dollars to decommission. And most of it is removing all of this stuff and sampling and making sure there's no activation out here, so on and so forth. So the neutrons are contained. So when the new, this is sh enough shielding so you don't have stray neutrons coming out, activating this wall over here, or activating this piece of equipment or the stairwell. Um, they shield all of the neutrons, not necessarily all of the um, gamma rays, because it's, it's just not economical and you don't really need to do it. The dust rates aren't that high. Um, so the, for a normal trigger, it's very well understood where the activation is, um, the extent of it, and you can do all your planning based on that. So I, I apologize, I had a much better picture um, there was an overlay of the University of Illinois uh, center that was uh, decommissioned pretty recently. This is my facility. So the reactor's there. The concrete monolith, we have a monolith instead of a, a pedestal, is there. This is Bay 1, it's the world's largest neutron radiography bay, and all of the University of Illinois entire facility fits in our Bay 1. <laughs> and uh, the Triga pedestal, uh, this is about 10 times larger than the pedestal. We have more concrete than any trigger reactor in the world. Um, and to complicate that, our neutron beams come out here. So we know the, we know the beam uh, stop and the, uh, the massive shutter when we don't want the beam in the room um, are activated. But we don't know if the uh, thousands of pounds of concrete, thousands of tons of concrete in this room, how activated it is, whether it's low level waste. Um, so we'll need extensive surveys and it, it, It'll be an absolutely enormous job. Um, so this is kind of what we were going back and forth with the university, and that's why I said, you guys better err on the side of caution and assume it's, it's gonna be a lot. And uh, yeah, prepare for that. Um, any questions? Okay, so uh, staffing and equipment is another challenge. So most of the research reactors have a director, business manager, reactor supervisor, electronics engineer is the most important person in that facility. Radiation safety officer, reactor operators, senior reactor operators, health physicists, experimentalists, research coordinators, and laboratory managers. Most one to two megawatt uh, facilities have five to six employees. Anyone want to guess how that's resolved? Do multiple, multiple jobs. Exactly. So everyone has to do multiple, multiple things, which uh, can be stressful at times. At other times, it's really rewarding. Um, some days I'm sitting writing reports all day long. Um, other days I'm moving fuel elements around, doing experiments. Um, I think it's a good thing, not everyone thinks it's a good thing, but uh, if you like doing lots of different things, a research reactor is, is definitely the place to be. Uh, the average age at the facility is 56 with me, averaged in, 59 without. Uh, so that's a big challenge. I ask every you know, year, is everyone happy? Are you happy? Do you want to stay here? It's, it's great here, you don't ever want to leave. And they go, no, no, it's great, we're going to stay. Go, okay, good. Uh, at the same time, we do want to bring in new people because the training of replacements is a really long process. 
Um, to be a level three radiographer, which we need to support our radiography program, it's about six years. So selling that to management at the university, we need to start training someone now so that in six years they can take over for this person that's retiring in six years is a tough sell. Um, and it takes about two to three years to make a reactor operator a senior reactor operator. Uh, and it's really just a trust issue. I came in and said, two years, you know, have you seen my resume? You know, I know what I'm doing. And uh, they said, no, 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 two years, two years. And then after I became a senior reactor operator, I said, you guys just wanted to get to know me for two years to make sure I wasn't going to do anything crazy. And they said, yes. So it's the senior reactor operators that have unrestricted access to the facility. Um, so that, that's why it's just, it's just a trust issue. And you don't want to <coughs> burden a student with getting called in the middle of the night to a security alarm. Uh, it's only the senior reactor operators that have to do that. Uh, so the age of most of the equipment uh, is the same as the staff. <laughs> so it was designed 50, 60 years ago. If we're lucky, it's only 30 or 40 years old. Uh, much of the equipment is legally required by our tech specs. Uh, it can't be purchased off the shelf. Uh, it can't be recreated and it can't be upgraded. So that's one of the other huge issues um, at, the, at the, the research reactor community is that upgrading the digital systems is, is an absolute no-no. And they're trying to figure out how to do it. And I was at a conference. Uh, do you remember Krista at Oregon State? Yeah. She, was, uh, she was at the center of this, not in any bad way. But I was at a presentation at a, about three years ago at our annual conference, in Port, happened to be in Portland. And the, the NRC is terrified that a digital control system, that a zero will become a one, and all the control rods will withdraw without the, reop, without the operator doing anything. Um, and they, she gave a, they gave a presentation. She was the operator who responded correctly. They were doing nothing. They were a DOE facility um, at Sandia, so they could, as long as DOE bought in on it, they didn't need the NRC to say, OK, to the digital upgrade. And the control rod, they were doing nothing. No one had their hand moving a magnet you know, up or down um, to move a control rod. And a control rod started withdrawing, and no one was touching the control. And the, she scrammed the reactor, and everything was fine. But the look on everyone from the NRC's face that, my god, it is possible that a digital system can misbehave and do that probably set it back 20 years. So and I, was, I was at that meeting. I'll, I'll never forget it. it was, the look on everyone's face was terrifyingly priceless. Do you think that it's a detriment to have such an older, like an old staff? Because not that they get lazy, but they feel like they know everything, so they're less likely to follow protocols? Uh, yes. So I, I think to try I mean, to get in younger people? Like no, I, I, absolutely. I mean, really just uh, the, the transfer knowledge and tribal knowledge. Our facility doesn't have that uh, because most of our operators uh, came from the Navy. Um, and the Navy system uh, the, the program is so stringent that it's they're all in their late 50s and it's completely ingrained in them. And they came out of the Navy 25, 30 years ago. Um, when, I st when they started training me as a reactor operator, it was follow everything to a T. Uh, everything had to be perfect, and, and I remember it was one day after I finally got qualified after two years, I was saying something, I was like, oh, I forgot to do this. Let me go upstairs to the reactor room and you know, do this. And uh, one of the guys slaps me on the back of the back, and he goes, ah, oh, it's fine, man, it can wait till tomorrow. It's not like the place will sink because they're all <laughs> submariners. Yeah. And that's the worst case scenario is the boat, the submarine sinking and everyone dying. At, the, at our facility, the worst thing that happens is, is, is you know, the experiment, you have to redo an experiment. It didn't work, this happened, you have to redo the experiment, which is not that bad. But yeah, definitely getting the younger folks in for the hands-on experience um, and to, to learn the better parts of the safety culture from the other folks. Uh, but yeah, occasionally, everyone ends up cutting corners. It just kind of happens. But, um, that's one of the drawbacks of everyone wearing so many different hats is that you get a little bit complacent and you cut corners, and that's, uh, um, I tell it that my biggest safety concern is Interstate 80. It's the most dangerous thing that everyone that works there does every day. And then the next thing is complacency. Um, okay, so how did I make it through these different things? Okay, so what happened my very first day with us dumping our primary water, obviously we weren't doing this, but the NRC did call saying they want to talk to the most senior person there and that they're very concerned. We have a monitor on our, our um, uh, pool level and we're saying, well, no, we're, we're looking at it. We can go up and verify, but it's, it's in the normal range. Everything's fine. What had happened was is the McClellan Air Force Base is a super fun site. And they had a lot of planes that, threw, that flew through H-bomb plumes to gather material to, to do tests on. 
and they'd take them out to the field, same place where they drain the oil and let it drain down on the ground, and they'd hose them off. So there's cesium-137 in the ground a lot of different places, and it's reached um, um, irrigation ditches and whatnot. So somebody saw this big ditch with hundreds of gallons of water pouring out of it and a radiation sign in front of it and said, aha, there's a nuclear reactor a mere 2,000 feet away. It must be from them. So instead of calling us, they called the state agency, they called EPA, they called the NRC, then the NRC called us. So <laughs> just remain calm, told them that no, there's not, it's not leaking, um, everything's fine, and because we have a good relationship with them, they believed us. So the fuel element getting stuck, um, after I said, I don't like these instructions, I'll pull very firmly, but not too firmly. Um, the folks that were there that, that were senior that had encountered this before, they took over and they said, watch how we do this. And it, it took um, about four hours and five ex-sailors swearing a lot to finally dislodge it and we had to retire that fuel element. Uh, they said, someday it will just be you here and you'll be the senior most person. And you'll be the only one who's ever seen this before. You need to remember how to do it. So watch us, ask any questions, and then you know, finally it was taken care of. Uh, otherwise, it would have taken like a couple of weeks to fix. Um, so the, the, the reactor operators. So there's this thing called document control at the NRC. You have your program manager and you have document control. Legally, you have to send everything with document control, a hard copy. Um, I, we've gotten in the habit of now sending everything in PDF to our program manager as well. So they, they had simply lost the renewal for, our two, for two of our operators. Uh, that was resolved later in the day, but still not the first email you want to read at 7.30 in the morning. So uh, last one that's kind of been an ongoing battle. Uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but uh, finally convinced university management in the last couple of years, if we can't get rid of the last couple of months, excuse me, if we can't get rid of the fuel, let's start building up these uh, educational programs that we haven't done in the past. Um, and fortunately, they, they finally bought off on it. So lessons learned, and hope, you, know, you might find yourself um, in situations similar to sooner than you think. Number one, don't panic. Uh, trust the expertise of people around you and don't be afraid to ask for help. I was not comfortable trying to dislodge that fuel element and I asked for help. I mean, they were there anyways and they helped me. Uh, this is a little bit different if a regulator tells you to do something because it's a requirement. Actually look up the requirement. Everyone is smart enough to do that and look up the legal requirement. We've hired a lot of lawyers and attorneys to do various things that, that I knew more about the, the, the 10 CFRs than they did. Um, so if, if a regulator comes and says you, you're required to do this, actually look at the 10 CFR or the California for what, uh, Title 17. Um, and I've gotten out of a lot of corrective actions doing that. And, and yeah, that's a very good thing. Uh, so always articulate your willingness to work with your regulator. Uh, I've been told this by my program manager. I'm not your friend, but I'm your partner in safety. And I've taken them up on that a few times. Um, and then de with dealing with the university, uh, articulate your regulatory requirements to the university leadership, uh, potential consequences for not being compliant. Um, I was in a meeting, I think it was a different accountant, um, not the bad math accounts, I have a lot of close friends that are accounts, and said, you don't want to get in trouble with the NRC, the issue finds really as a last resort, um, and the, the person told me that, how do we know we're walking the line close enough if we never get fined, is what was told to me. And what they're used to is Yolo County coming in and, and, and finding a lot of small things wrong with the university. And that's how they pay for Yolo County hazmat, basically. Um, I had to explain to them that getting fined by the NRC is completely unacceptable for, for any reason. It's a really big deal. And you can go, all, the, all of the 24 research reactors in the US can go 10 years without getting an actual fine. It's, it's that rare. Um, and it really should remain that rare. Um, and then ultimately what happened with our decommissioning, they, they were considering it, they were evaluating it, and they wouldn't believe us that we couldn't get rid of the fuel. Um, and they finally, we had to bring in a third party that both people trusted to sit down and say, um, to, to fact check and, and verify. And I knew I was right, so I wasn't worried. I was like, of course bring in a third party. Um, and then ultimately that, that helped our case out tremendously to keep running. Um, and this one I didn't believe until a year or two ago. Upper management, you know, provost, dean, chancellor, whatever the study says that you do, they will only read the executive summary. We had a, a decommissioning study that was done by Dave Muller. If any of you ever interview with Dave Muller, don't ever mention my name because you won't get the job. They absolutely hate me. 
because I fought them so bitterly on this decommissioning study because I knew it was flawed, severely flawed, and the university was going to base a really big decision on a very flawed study that was going to have bad, uh, bad repercussions for them. Um, and the study said there's a lot of uncertainty uh, politically with getting rid of the fuel, so on and so forth. Um, that you know doesn't really recommend it. The executive study basically said they do recommend it. So, yeah. And so you know it was 40 pages long. There's no way that the chancellor is going to read that. They're going to read this um, on the front page. And then finally, plan for all contingencies. So I've been mostly talking about the challenges. So let's talk about a few of the neat things that you can do in a research reactor. Uh, this is ATR, and I think this is UC Irvine. So we're kind of somewhere in between. If you and power level, if you plot it uh, logarithmic. I suppose, two megawatts. Um, it's a really neat place to work. I like working there. Uh, you can do a lot of different things. Um, the last class that Kai Vetter brought up, was anyone in that class? Okay. It's it's CSI reading them through. Okay, so what we did, I thought it would be fun, and I, you know, I run the reactor, and I can do anything I want to, as long as it's allowed by our, our safety analysis. So I found an old horseshoe that was dug up in my backyard, and we did, uh, uh, we dated it based on what ice temps were present in it. Turns out it was somewhere between uh, the Civil War and uh, World War II because of the, the isotopes that were in it. So that was pretty cool. Uh, we get to do lots of little experiments on our own uh, simply because of our intellectual curiosity. So here's the, co here's the core here. Uh, so the pink ones are uh, 3020 elements, um, and then the, the white ones are all 2020. Black ones are uh, graphite dummies, and that's the one that got stuck. That used to be white. And now it's black because it got stuck on me. We had to declare it as damaged fuel. It didn't leak. We had to declare it as damaged, take it out of service. Uh, so some of the features that you see down here, um, that's the core itself. Instead of having a central thimble, which is just the A ring vacant, we have a graphite reflector in our B ring. We're not allowed to put fuel in our B ring. Does anyone want to take a guess? I'll give you a hint. The one megawatt reactors are allowed to put fuel in their B ring. They'll overheat. It'll get too hot. So if we're at two megawatts, we put any kind of fuel there, it'll exceed 750 degrees C. Um, so we have to flatten out the flux and push it a little bit more to the outside to keep that from happening. Uh, but it's good because we have a relatively large volume that we can put things in the center of the reactor. Uh, peak, peak thermal flux at a megawatt is 1 times 10 to the 13th. Um, so just a little bit short of uh, some of the bigger facilities, 10 to the 14th, you can start doing neat things like molly production and so on and so forth. Um, most of what we do is neutron radiography, neutron activation analysis. Uh, and this facility called the NIF, which I told them that acronym had already been taken. Um, but I, I made some, is anyone here a fusion person a little more? Okay, well, so I, I, I joked with some students from Berkeley that came out that this NIF and the other NIF have something in common, neither can achieve. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so I apologize if anyone's offended, but it, it is somewhat angry. Okay, so we have normal reflector. So we have the uh, big beam ports uh, going to bay one, uh, excuse me, bay one, bay three, bay two, and bay four. Um, outside of that, uh, we have all of these holders that hold, uh, it's about four inches. And then we're going to do that. Okay, actually, only be a few minutes over. Um, and they used to do silicon doping at the facility. So they take these ingots, uh, three inch ingots, um, I think 15 inches long, put them on the outside of the reactor. Uh, they actually upgraded the reactor from one megawatt to two megawatt. Um, it was a radial grid, grid plate before, now it's hexagonal, so I mean, it was a big deal to change it out. And the only reason they did it is to switch over to do two megawatts 24-7 uh, to do silicon doping because the flux out here um, is about uh, 310 to the 11th, I wanna say. So it's a, bit, it's a huge drop off from the center of the core to go outside the reflector. Uh, so they'd run for weeks and weeks and weeks, uh, flip the underwater to, to make the distribution on the z-axis better, put them back in, and it was, it was quite profitable until um, they went to a slightly larger ingot size and went to a different reactor. Um, the this ingots were single crystal silicon. They were about $50,000 when they were brought to the facility, about $100,000 um, when they left the facility, and now we use them as door stops because the program went away. And they didn't ask for them back for some reason. Um, <laughs> Uh, you can see here, here's our nuclear instrument. So we have a uh, nine scale um, fission chamber. And then on the other side, you can't see it, but it's an uh, uncompensated ion uh, chamber 
So one runs the whole power range, and the other one is just 1% to 100% power. For some reason, all the other one megawatt reactors seem to have three. They have an extra um, uncompensated ion chamber. I don't know why we only have two. Hopefully, they don't make us put that in with the license amendment. Uh, a few other features. This shoots water across the top of the core so that the um, M16 doesn't go straight out into the uh, uh, reactor room, so it mixes at the bottom of the tank a little bit. Um, and then that's our transient rod, and you see a bunch of other control rods. And then spent fuel all inside. Any questions? Yes? On the map, what are like B4? B5, they're like not actually circles. Uh, what do you see? Yeah, right there. Oh, oh, so that's it. There, there's fuel there. Um, it's just there's the opening in the grid plane. So you could, in theory, remove all three of those, um, shuffle the fuel a little bit, fill these graphite positions, and then you have a larger radiation position um, where you can put in like an actual two inch experiment. We've never done it before. Most triggers never do. Um, if, if, it won't, if it won't work in this hole that's higher flux, that's slightly smaller, chances are it's not going to work in a slightly larger hole with, with half the flux. How often do you reconfigure the core? Um, typically only when we get new fuel. Uh, the last one we did was six years ago, so I've actually never seen the shuffle. We do take all the leading elements out, um, so everything in C-ring, all the 3020 fuel, and all the positions around the transient rod will get thermally the hottest. Uh, we inspect those annually for elongation, bowing, um, cracks, pitting, all of that. And if we find a, a defect where we have to retire any of those, we get to do all of the other elements. Um, so that's, what, that's what's written in our technical specifications. But yeah, I, we really could move the inner fuel out more. Uh, we started out with 8.5 weight percent fuel, and then we switched over to 20-20. To and the idea is that as we cut new fuel in, uh, we would go and ultimately all of the, the white positions would be 30-20, and then these pink positions would transition to 45 weight percent fuel, 20% enriched, and then we just have fuel for ages and ages and ages. This was also back when we were operating 24-7, and you know, they, they needed a lot of fuel to, to operate 24-7, two megawatts. Any other questions? We're talking about a few of the neat applications. So fast radiations uh, in this facility in the NIF. <laughs> it's surrounded by boral, so it's a, it's a fast uh, neutron facility. It's about 10 to the 10 of uh, uh, 1 MeV neutron equivalent per second. And what that's used for is basically two things it's used for. Um, so this, we are, uh, we are irradiating um, wheat seeds for University of Idaho to do mutagenesis studies. So you take the wheat seeds up to the LD50, half of them die, the other half the other half um, become severely mutated. They don't sell those to people. They plant them, look for advantageous mutations. Um, and in this day and age, it's basically pest control and drought resistance is what they're looking for, for better fruiting. But then they genetically isolate those genes from the mutated. And by the, the, the first generation, it's actually making it to market is like the fourth or fifth generation. So we're not giving people irradiated food or anything like that. And by the time we release them from the facility, they're not ready. We let the seeds decay off. Uh, because most of these people don't have licenses for radioactive material. Um, that's pretty common. And the tie-in to um, LCS, or uh, Large Hadron Collider, um, is that we do electron a lot of electronics testing. So we're looking to make sure that the electronics um, at the LHC don't fail halfway through and they have to stop the run. Um, when you put things up in orbit, you want to know that in that radiation field, will they last 20 years? So 20 years in orbit is pretty equivalent to 20 minutes in that position at like 1% power. Um, so it's a very, very easy thing to do. And we can actually uh, instrument that position so you can watch your, uh, your detector or electronics uh, be destroyed as we're irradiating it. So uh, pretty, pretty unique. Okay, neutron radiography. Um, so everyone's familiar with you know, x-rays, what they're good at. They're good at seeing high Z, high density materials inside of low Z low density materials. Neutron radiography, I don't want to say it's the opposite, but one of the things that it's really good at is, is seeing hydrogen. It has a high, relatively high absorption cross-section, high scattering cross-section, scatters it out of the plane of radiography. So this is a picture of just a normal ficus that we brought in and took a picture of, of that. Uh, so you can see root structure. Uh, we do have the, um, the wine folks come in quite a bit looking for drought resistant uh, great plants and they look at root structure and see how much they can stress them 
what's happening to them physiologically, and then they give them water and stress them again and over and over and over again, and uh, they take pictures using them at the facility. So the, exp <laughs> the explosives thing, what does this plant and the high explosives have in common? A lot of hydrogen. A lot of hydrogen. Um, and in the, the field, so this is all the <coughs> legitimate purposes. It's NASA, um, folks like that coming in. Uh, I should give that disclaimer. Um, so usually in, in devices that have high explosive, explosive bolts, um, separator rings. Um, has anyone ever seen like a big um, parachute drop of like a Hummer? Like you'll see it drop, 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 and right before it hits the ground, it cuts the parachute core, so then the last like foot, it just drops down. And they do that so it doesn't hit the ground, wind take the parachutes, and just start dragging the Hummer <laughs> off the cliff. So next time you see one of those, watch for at the very end, the lines get cut. So that's an industrial cutter that has a, a, a pyrotechnic charge in it that fires and a guillotine goes and then cuts the, uh, cuts the line. Uh, we have uh, like half a million dollars worth of those in the facility right now that they're, they're doing neutron radio. Um, so looking to make sure that uh, the, the high explosive has been laid correctly. If there's a, if there's a gap in it, the, the detonation uh, wave won't propagate to the other side of that gap, and it only takes um, a, you know, a few hundredths of an inch. And if they verify there's no gaps in it, they know the device will work very, very well. Uh, so these are things that can't fail. So things that go on rockets, things from the military. Um, every time we see a rocket blow up, we're like waiting for Elon Musk's VP to show up at our facility and just with a suitcase full of money and offer to, to buy the facility. <laughs> um, so that, that's, that's a lot of what we do. Um, so this is uh, Bay One, world's largest bay. It looks bigger than that. Uh, I presented, I showed this photo um, to some Sac State physics students and uh, they go, where's the reactor? And I go, oh wait, that's not shrink off radiation. That's just the, <laughs> the tint in the room. The reactor is basically be right about here. So down at a 20 degree angle. And they, it would take them an entire eight hour shift to do, to do the entire wing, piece by piece by piece, looking for corrosion. Okay, so I just a couple more slides. I promise I won't keep you over too much. Um, so our, sort of our finest hour was 2013 spacewalks. Anyone hear about this? Um, so it was an Italian astronaut on a spacewalk, um, and there's, there's two systems that share a single pump. Uh, one circulates cooling water to, to cool off the suit, the other one is your drinking water, but it uses a mu uh, mutual pump to save weight, because it's really expensive to put things in, in space. Um, and it failed, and it put about a liter and a half of water into his helmet when he was on a spacewalk. And his, they were monitoring his vitals, and it went from a relatively calm and cool, you know, 120 beats per minute to like 220. And he explained what was going on as best he could. And he had to keep pushing the water away from his mouth. So blow out the water, breathe in, um, in order so he wouldn't drown in outer space. Mm. Um, so they initiated emergency pr procedure and it took him uh, 45 minutes to get back in uh, to the space station to take off his helmet. So he had to do that for 45 minutes uh, or he would die. Okay, so they thought they knew it, so they landed it uh, in Kazakhstan, flew the spacesuit over. In the meantime, they suspend all operations, um, so no one can do spacewalks. Uh, they took it to um, Ames first to do micro CT on it. They couldn't see anything because they thought it was this um, hydrogen-containing material that clogged it, and it's a, it's a titanium pump. You know, you're not going to see it with x-rays. So they brought it to us after they went to Ames. We did a 3D uh, tomography run on it, and we were able to identify this little lump of stuff. And they said, okay, great, we found it, it's there, and they took it and disappeared. So they didn't really give us too many details. Um, but it's a good thing they did, because at the same time, one of the two main um, systems that vents heat to outer space failed, and they can only be repaired from outside of the space station. So if the other one had failed during this two-week period, they would have had to abandon the space station. So the head of NASA at his morning meeting while all this is going on, what we have the pump is what's going on with the pump, and every meeting he ended with what's going on with the pump. So we were the center of the NASA world for and We got some commendation that they hadn't given out in like 15 years, so we were very, very proud of that. Uh, and then happy that the astronaut is okay. Uh, so uh, what I'm really here to talk about, this is the second to last slide, uh, is we're looking at doing a reactor operator program. Uh, potentially having, uh, you don't need the lectures that the Davis students need because they don't, they don't know about dosimetry, they don't know about, they don't know what K is and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we're thinking about um, offering a laboratory to, to the students here who are interested in it. Uh, one of the other things we're looking at, this is why I was at UT Austin, is they have a remote read-only 
uh, remote display of the reactor. You can't control it because that would make everyone at NRC have a heart attack. Uh, but you can read all of it out. It's actually it was a much better display than the, than the general atomics display for the actual reactor because it would plot things like period, and so it had all these plots to it, which was really really nice. Um, so we're, we want to get that put together so that you can do um, rod cals and you know insertion of positive reactivity, negative reactivity. You can do it from here, and all you need is the remote login and call one of the senior reactor operators on a cell phone and say, okay, now withdraw this this rod 100 units. Go to this power, do this, do that, and you don't have to uh, battle Interstate 80 coming out to the, uh, to the facility. So that's that's one of the things we're looking at. Um, and then having folks come out for senior projects, we have lots of projects people can do, uh, and master's project, PhD, I and mean, you already have, you already know what you're working on. So either it involves a reactor or it doesn't. Um, so that's really what we 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 uh, like to, to partner more with this uh, and as an alumni. Of course, I, I'm advocating for that. Um, so anything that we can do uh, that would uh, you know, help train and educate the uh, next generation of nuclear scientists, health physicists, everyone in the field, uh, we're definitely interested. So if you're interested in it too, nag your professors. Um, and then that's my short-term plan for educating people. That's my long-term plan uh, for educating the next generation of, uh, of health physicists, reactor physicists. My, my wife, we met in grad school, so she's a health physicist too. Not that we want to pressure her into going into the field, but uh, we, did, we did name her Laura. And her name's Josephine. If she wants to be an artist, that's fine with mom and dad. Okay, are there any questions about any technical questions, non technical questions? Let's thank you. Thank you. We did joke that if we had um, fraternal twins that we were going to do Allie and Dak, but <laughs> <laughs> we probably would have chickened out. Yeah. Yes? Considering that you guys don't have a nuclear program at your university, do you find that it's difficult to incorporate your students in the daily operation of the reactor? Uh, absolutely. Our, our biggest challenge is the distance. We're 26 miles, and where everyone here walks, everyone at UC Davis rides a bike. And people have asked me, can I ride a bike across the causeway? It's like, physically you can, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> um, so the transportation has been um, a real issue. So we're trying to set up regular transportation um, to make it a little bit easier. When I say regular, like, you know, once a week, twice a week, and you have one opportunity to get picked up, one opportunity to get dropped off. Um, but I mean from an educational perspective. Uh, yes. Okay. It is difficult. Um, the new um, chair of the physics departments and Navy Nuke, and really there just hasn't been a lot of interest from um, an on-campus faculty champion to say, let's have more involvement, let's do some more hands-on stuff. I mean, obviously we're not going to have a, any program like there is here. I mean, it's, it's, that's absolutely not going to happen. But to get more involvement, it really needs a, a faculty member to champion it. And now that we have a couple, um, it seems like things are, are going to move forward. And uh, UC Davis, basically physics, but it's part of our computer science and security consortium. Um, so uh, we are actually pushing them to add more courses. And I think they're thinking of adding some uh, maybe reactor physics course or something like that. But we also need to be more active. Uh, yes, it takes about two hours to drive, but it's a fantastic facility. Yeah, and it's not, you know, if there's a series of irradiations, I mean, we would like you to come out, you know, potentially do the first, especially if it's for a, you know, a master's thesis. But after that, if there's subsequent irradiations, I mean, we can do them. Um, but to get you out and at least have you do a few of them um, is, is a good educational thing. So that, that's kind of what we're looking at. Other questions? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If not, let's thank Wesley again. Any stories that